portion of God's Word that we'll focus our hearts on on this Holy Thursday. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When you hear the word communion, what do you picture? If you're a, a Christian lifer, you probably hear communion as a synonym with the Lord's Supper, the sacrament which Jesus instituted on this Holy Thursday. But to secular ears, that word communion has the connotation of, of sharing and connection within a, a close, intimate relationship. Think of our word community, or people who live in a, a commune. In fact, in Latin, if you break the word communion down, it literally means a union with. And that's why we sometimes refer to the Lord's Supper as Holy Communion. Because in this sacramental meal, God gives to us blessed communion. Union and sharing and connection within a close, intimate relationship. And God gives us through communion, this blessed communion, in two different ways, which we're going to talk about tonight. First, God gives us blessed communion through Holy Communion with himself. There's four places in Scripture where the institution of the Lord's Supper is recorded for us. Three times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then the fourth time in 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church that we hear as our sermon text for tonight. And in all four of those accounts, we hear the same basic formula. The wording is maybe a little bit different, but we have the same basic idea in all four. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In all four accounts, we hear four elements highlighted. Two of them are natural, bread and wine, and two of them are miraculous, Jesus' body and blood. We call this the doctrine of the, the real presence. The belief that Jesus' true body and blood are really present along with the bread and the wine when we receive the Lord's Supper. So what that means is when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are literally coming into a close, intimate union with God himself. In this special meal, God literally comes to us and he gives to us the very body and blood of our Savior Jesus who lived and died to forgive the world of its sins. And you and I literally get to consume the body and blood of Jesus into ourselves. Much closer of a union can you get with God than that. And yet you probably also understand that this idea, this doctrine of the real presence, it's kind of a divisive thing within the Christian church. Although a lot of churches like ours believe in the real presence, there's plenty of other Christian churches out there that believe in something called representationalism, which basically means that Jesus is speaking figuratively when he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Picture a kid with a stick saying, this is a sword. So they're saying Jesus' body and blood aren't really present in this sacrament. It's simply a symbolic, figurative way that the bread and the wine, they represent Jesus' body and blood. It makes sense that there's this kind of divide within the Christian church, doesn't it? That this idea of the real presence is a little strange, seems illogical, maybe impossible. How could Jesus be sitting there with his disciples in his flesh and blood and give to them his body and blood? How could Jesus possibly, over the span of the last 2,000 years, continually give his body and blood to all the Christians over all the world during that time that have been receiving this meal? Doesn't seem possible, right? It would take a miracle. Yeah. God's pretty good at those, though, isn't he? And yet we see that that these people, these churches that would say, right, it's all representation, it's, it's, all, it's all symbolic, right? Jesus' body and blood aren't really there. This is just bread and wine and we eat it to remember him. It's logical, isn't it? 
It's a whole lot easier for our minds to comprehend, right? But is that what Jesus said? See, every time that Jesus speaks the words of institution in the Bible, he never says, this is like my body, or this represents my blood. No, every time Jesus says the same thing. This is my body. This is my blood. And so which of those two interpretations requires us to to read our own opinions and thoughts into Jesus' words? And which of them simply takes Jesus at his word? You see, when the Bible speaks figuratively, and it does, when the Bible speaks figuratively, the context of the Bible in that section makes it very clear that it's speaking in figurative language. But in all of these accounts of the institution of the Lord's Supper, we don't get that indication in any way. Which means that the only reason we have to believe that Jesus is speaking figuratively when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, is we as human beings are trying to come up with a rational, reasonable explanation to our human brains of how this could work. But where does that lead? If everything that is miraculous, everything that is supernatural in the Bible, we chalk it up to it's just God speaking figuratively, what slippery slope does that lead us down? Maybe Jesus isn't really true God and true man. Maybe God really isn't the creator of all things. Maybe Jesus didn't really rise from the dead on Easter. If we always say that something that doesn't make sense to us must be figurative language, where does that lead us? Well, let's just say, for the sake of argument, for the sake of playing devil's advocate, let's say, for the sake of argument tonight, that the, the apostles of Jesus, they just totally messed this up They misunderstood everything that Jesus was telling them when they were gathered around the table. They totally missed the symbolic meaning that he had behind this sacrament. The Gospels are history lessons. The recounting of the life and the ministry of Jesus. But 1 Corinthians is a doctrinal letter. It's inspired by God to teach and instruct people in biblical truth. And Paul himself tells us in 1 Corinthians... For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. So you find in the Bible that after Paul's conversion to the faith, Jesus literally teaches him everything that he needs to know about the faith via revelation. And so think of this. A doctrinal letter, and Paul has been instructed specifically by Jesus. If the apostles have messed this up, and they missed the understanding that Jesus wanted them to have, this, letter to the first, this first letter to the Corinthians would be the perfect opportunity for God to set the record straight. To tell the people and correct the church and say, guys, you got this wrong. Jesus meant this symbolically, not literally. But he doesn't. In fact, Paul doubles down on the real presence of Jesus' body and blood along with the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. In the chapter before our sermon text, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul writes this, Is not the cup of thanksgiving a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread a participation in the body of Christ? To participate in something means that you are there. And you're actively involved in it. And then in our chapter that our sermon text comes from, Paul writes this. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Tell me, how could an unworthy use of this special meal that Jesus instituted make us guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Jesus if Jesus' body and blood wasn't really present in this meal. Maybe you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? What difference does it make whether we believe that Jesus' body and blood are really there, whether this is all just symbolic, figurative language? What difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. Just think how differently you approach this meal, depending on whether you see this as the body and blood of your Savior or just some bread and wine. You see, if it's just bread and wine, then the Lord's Supper is just something that that we do for God, not something that he does for us. 
If it's just some bread and wine, then the Lord's Supper just becomes one more act, one more activity that you and I have to perform as we climb our way up the mountain to get to God. Not a miraculous way that God descends to us. Miraculously giving us things like forgiveness and salvation and the strengthening of our faith. See, whether you see this as the true body and blood of Jesus or just some bread and wine completely changes the way that you approach this meal. Just like you'd have a different approach going to meet a wax statue that looks a lot like your favorite celebrity compared to how you would approach a meet and greet with your favorite celebrity in the flesh. And so it makes all the difference in the world. And that's why Paul instructs us that when we receive this meal, when we receive this special sacramental meal that Jesus instituted, that meal that brings us into an intimate, close connection and union with God himself, that there's a certain sense of awe and care and preparation that needs to take place as we prepare to meet God face to face in this meal. Paul writes, So then, because Jesus has shown us his body and blood are really present in this meal, so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. See, Paul warns us that if we aren't properly prepared to receive this meal, instead of receiving it to the spiritual benefit that God intends, we can actually receive it to our spiritual harm. And that's why Paul tells us that we need to know what it means to be properly prepared. But please understand, to receive it in an unworthy manner does not mean you're too sinful. If you are lugging around, burdened and weighted down by the weight of your sins and your guilt and your shame, if you are carrying that around and it is constantly wearing you down day by day, that guilt and shame of your sin, then you are exactly the kind of person that Jesus instituted this meal for. God wants you to drag the weight of your guilt and your shame and lay it down at the foot of the cross as you receive the same body and blood that went to the cross to give you forgiveness and removal of all your guilt and shame. And so, unworthy manner does not mean too sinful. But this is what Paul says unworthy manner means. He says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What does it mean to examine yourself? If I say an exam... All the high schoolers and college students break out into a sweat. You know that in an exam, right, you have to answer weighty, important questions that evaluate your, your understanding of the content you've been taking in the class. In the same way, when we examine ourselves in preparation for receiving the Lord's Supper, we have to ask ourselves important, weighty questions to evaluate our hearts and our preparedness for receiving this special meal. Now, if you look in your hymnal, on page 295, there's like two pages of Christian questions that Martin Luther developed that you can ask yourself and examine yourself with in preparation for the Lord's Supper. For the sake of time tonight, I think we're going to boil it down to four basic questions that we want to ask ourselves when we examine our hearts for the Lord's Supper. The first question is, am I sorry and repentant for my sins? The second question do I believe that Jesus died to forgive my sins? Third, do I believe that Jesus gives me his real body and blood in this sacrament? And then finally, will I use the spiritual strengthening that this sacrament gives to me to fight and struggle against the temptation to just pick up those sins I've been forgiven for and continue in them again? See, if you're not repentant or sorry for your sins, or you have every intention to lay your sins down but just pick them right back up again and keep living in them, 
or you don't really believe that Jesus is your Savior, you don't really believe that Jesus gives you his true body and blood in this sacrament, then Paul warns us that you shouldn't be taking this meal because you're not properly prepared. Paul says, he reinforces that question number three that we said in the end of this section. He says, those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, the Greek word that's translated discerning here is the same Greek word that they would use for what a merchant does with the coins that a customer pays him with in the marketplace. When he received the coins for the wares that he had sold, he would discern them, inspecting them and looking at them to verify that they were real and not counterfeit. And so Paul here warns us that if we don't discern the true body and blood of Jesus in this sacrament, if we don't understand and acknowledge the real presence of our Savior in this meal, then we receive it to our spiritual detriment and harm. And that's one reason that our church and the church body that we belong to practices what's called close communion. Close communion is basically the practice of only inviting those to come and receive communion with us who are members of our church or our church body, those that have been instructed deeply and thoroughly in all of the teachings of Scripture. Now, this is the, actually the historical practice of the Christian church, maybe not so much in modernity. But that practice of close communion in our inclusive, driven world today is looked at with a lot of scorn. It's viewed as being judgmental and exclusive and maybe downright unloving. Maybe even you have said with kind of a sheepish apology to your friend or to your family member, sorry, our church is one of those really strict ones that only lets members come to communion. And if it was just bread and wine, then yeah, it would be unloving for us to practice close communion. Just as it would be unloving for us to say that only members of our church, only card-carrying members could partake in the coffee and the snacks after the services were done. If it was just bread and wine, then it would be unloving for us to exclude anyone from this meal. But we've just seen from Scripture again and again that it's not just bread and wine. In this meal, we come into a beautiful and close union with the body and blood of Jesus himself. And that means that there has to be a necessary amount of preparedness and understanding before we partake in something as important as that. Think of it this way. Would you say it's unloving that we require teenagers to take driver's ed and spend a certain amount of classroom time and a certain amount of time practicing behind the wheel before we throw them a license and let them jump on the NASCAR race that is I-295? Would you say it's unloving that we require a person to go through a hunter's safety course before we give them a hunting license and a rifle and send them out in the woods to start blasting things? I think we would say it's actually unloving if we don't set certain requirements and restrictions and expectations for the use of things like a car or a gun. Because we understand that something like a car or a gun is a powerful thing that has the ability to cause harm to that person or to other people if they don't understand how to properly use it. And so would it be loving of us? Would it be loving of us as a church if we invited every, every Johnny Methodist or Joey Baptist or Janet Atheist who walks through the door to come on up and partake of this meal with us and basically invite them to come and sin against the body and blood of Jesus and bring spiritual harm on themselves? Would that be loving? No more loving than it would be to throw a teenager out on the road without any experience behind the wheel or to hand a gun to a loaded child. See, there's this necessity that there is preparation and understanding of something before we put something powerful in people's hands. And so the fact is, it's not a desire to not have people take communion with us. It's the exact opposite. We want everyone to be able to take communion with us. But we want them to be able to take communion when they properly understand what the Lord's Supper really is. And they're able to properly prepare themselves to receive this meal to the spiritual benefit that God intends it to give. And we also practice close communion for a second reason. 
And that is the, the second kind of blessed communion that God gives to us through Holy Communion. That is the, the blessed communion that we get to share in a horizontal relationship with the people that we take the Lord's Supper with. You see, except for in extreme circumstances, we don't take the Lord's Supper by ourselves. We take it as a larger group, as a, a community of people. And so the Lord's Supper is a way for us to express visually to everyone around us the kind of unity of faith that we share with one another. And not just a unity on some aspects of faith or some teachings of the Bible, but on all of it. And so as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread and the Lord's Supper when we partake of that together, it unites us together as one. It's an expression of a unity of our faith when we eat it together. And so we don't want anyone to make a false confession of their faith and what they believe by taking the Lord's Supper with us and our church and our church body if they don't really understand what we actually believe and teach. And that's why we ask our guests, those who are not members of Victory or another Wells Church, to hold off on taking communion with us until we've had an opportunity to talk with them more about what the Bible says Holy Communion is. To have deeper discussions and to study Scripture together so we can know what we believe and teach and what the Bible and God's Word really says. Again, not because we want to be exclusive, but because we want people to know the spiritual truth, the truth that they need to know. See, that way, when we've gone through those steps and we've studied together and we've talked about what communion is, then you are able to take the Lord's Supper and be united into that blessed communion that God gives us in this meal. Then you are able to know with full confidence that you are part of a blessed communion of encouragement and love and fellowship that brings us together, united in our faith. Blessed communion, indeed. But if you're like me, it's easy to lose sight of all that sometimes, isn't it? It's easy to get kind of apathetic and bored and not really pay attention to the Lord's Supper when we have it. It becomes so easy to walk through those doors and sit down in the seats and look up front and see those gold plates on the altar and go, oh, communion today, huh? Okay. Without giving a second thought to preparing your heart to receive it. It's so easy to come up here to feast on the body and blood of our Savior Jesus and to be thinking instead about what you're going to go and eat after the service is done. It's so easy to, to come forward and be paying attention to what the lady in front of you is wearing or to look at those people who have offended you in the past and get focused on that instead of thinking about how this meal unites us and bonds us together as one, as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's easy for me to stand up here and be more focused on the words that I need to say and to be disappointed by the people who aren't here than to rejoice in the fact that God gives me the opportunity to give you something that unites you with him and that binds us all together as one. So friends, on this night where we focus in on Jesus instituting this amazing meal, please don't ever lose sight of the unfathomable miracle that takes place every single time we receive the Lord's Supper. Rejoice in it. Be in awe of it. Be careful about preparing yourself for it. Because in this blessed communion that God gives us, you get to be united with God himself. You get to be united with God in a close, intimate relationship where he gives you the same body and blood that went to the cross to forgive you of your sins, and he continues to give you his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins and the assurance of eternal life in him. You get to be a part of a blessed communion where despite our vast differences in so many areas of life, God unites all of us together as one as brothers and sisters, as family members, as children of Christ, united in our faith in him. Him who gave himself for us and who gives himself for us so that we can be in eternal blessed communion with God and each other. This is his body 
This is his blood given for you. Amen.